joined us before, you'll know that Calgary Arts and Development uses group agreements to set shared expectations and a commitment to safety and bravery in the space that we're occupying together today. Those agreements can be found in the instructions document that's going to be posted in the chat. At a summer town hall, the community-wise anti-racist organizational change working group shared with us uh, their accountable spaces guidelines. And today we're gonna focus on using those. You can also find those guidelines in the instructions document that was sent out <clears throat> and we're gonna post that link in the chat. Um, some uh, highlights from those, share the space. Be mindful of your speaking time, making space for others to speak and avoid interrupting others. Please keep mics on mute when not speaking. Uh, feel free to post reactions in the chat. If the moderator is open to questions at that time, please use the raised hand function. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Understand that individuals experience racism in very different ways. Recognize that each experience and viewpoint is valid, even if they differ. Uh, validate experiences rather than lecturing or giving advice. And consider that you don't need to agree with a perspective in order to understand that perspective. Speak for yourself. Use I language. Don't speak for others and don't share someone else's stories or experiences. Notice your own biases and judgments and avoid making assumptions about other people. Examine your own privilege and be aware of potential power dynamics that you might be contributing in our space. Recognize that we're all in a place of learning. If you say something problematic, apologize, listen to the voices of others, and then learn and adjust your behavior. Be open to calling in harmful attitudes as well as the open to critical self-reflection. If an individual tells you that something you said was harmful to them, listen to them. Use these situations not to harass or call out, but as a learning experience. Take care of yourself. Think of someone you can trust, whom you can debrief with, and plan to contact them after the, the town hall today. It's okay if you need to leave the room at any time. Facilitators are available for follow-up conversations. In addition to these accountable space guidelines, I want to also state that we recognize that asking people to share in this space is a request that requires emotional labor and vulnerability. Calgary Arts Development commits to the promise that there will be no retribution against people for the stories and perspectives they're sharing, uh, both from our speakers and from uh, the participants in the town hall today. Um, we ask all our participants uh, to commit to those same uh, um, principles. Any participant who uses harmful or disrespectful language or who actively is disregarding the group agreements will be asked to leave the town hall. If they choose not to leave, they'll be removed. Please privately chat with Taylor, uh, who is supporting today's town hall as an active bystander. If you feel uncomfortable or unsafe or see that a participant is using harmful or offensive language, uh, please let Taylor know. Taylor, can you introduce yourself so that people can find you on the screen? Yes, hello everyone, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Taylor and like Greg said, I'll be the uh, active bystander for our town hall today. So please feel free to private chat with me if you feel uncomfortable or unsafe, or if you feel that the group agreements um, are not being respected. So that's part of my role today as an active bystander is to help ensure that we're collectively adhering to these agreements. And any participants who break those will be contacted directly by myself and if necessary, removed uh, from the discussion. Or Zoom will do it for me today. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. Um, we'll be opening the floor for questions after our invited guests share their thoughts with us. And we hope to hear from as many of you as possible today. If you'd like to speak, please open the participants list at the bottom of the uh, bottom middle of your screen. Um, at the bottom of that list, you'll see raise hand. You may also indicate that you would like to share uh, using the chat and we'll be tracking that. When you speak, please clearly state your name and pause before speaking so people have time to find your screen. If your Zoom username is different than the name you'll introduce yourself by, please use the menu function to update your name so it's easier to find you. You can use the three dot menu. Uh, if you hover over a picture of yourself, you'll see three dots beside the mute. Um, um, you can update your name and share your pronouns in there. Uh, Leslie Hinger and I, uh, both of us staff at CADA, We'll be collecting questions from the chat box and watching for raised hands. We'll try to get to as many people and questions as possible in our limited amount of time today. If you have any questions or challenges with the technology or accessibility, again, please private chat with Mark. Uh, I'd now like to invite my colleague Sable Sweetgrass to do a welcome and land acknowledgement. Hello, Oki, everyone. Thank you. 
all for uh, attending this uh, this week's uh, town hall. Um, my name is Sable Sweetgrass, and my I'm from the Guyanai Nation in southern Alberta. Um, my uh, Blackfoot name is Nado and um, I was born and raised for the most part here in uh, Mohkensis, which is what we call Calgary. Um, and this, where we are meeting today uh, here in Mohkensis, is in Treaty 7 territory. And Treaty 7 uh, is the treaty that was signed in September 22nd of 1877 at Blackfoot Crossing. Um, which is about an hour east of Calgary on the Siksika Nation. Um, and that treaty was signed between the Blackfoot, the Tsutina Nation, and the Stony Nakoda Nations, um, uh, like I said, back in 1877. And so uh, uh, those were the parties to the uh, signing of Treaty 7, but the other the other party to that signing was also Canada, which is um, which involves all of you. All all Canadians are also signatures to that treaty, and um, and I think a lot of what people um, have a lot of questions and and maybe don't even really know too much about uh, Treaty Seven. And I highly encourage you to to uh, look into, into that um, because that is the founding document of this land, this place that we all call home. And I think it's important that uh, Albertans and Calgarians and, and uh, people who live here in Southern Alberta um, get to know uh, that treaty and get to know the First Nations uh, here in Treaty 7. Um, today, uh, we share this land with uh, First Nations from all across Canada and also the United States, uh, from with the Inuit people and with uh, the Métis Nation, people from the Métis Nation. So we have all, uh, all uh, diversity of First Nations people, and then as well as people from all around the world. And uh, it's really important to get to know this land and, and to get to know the people of this land, uh, the language of this land, which is, <clears throat> which is Blackfoot. And the reason it's so important to get to know uh, the people is uh, we're trying to combat racism uh, in, in all across Canada. And just recently I attended the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's uh, Vigil uh, here in Calgary, uh, it was on Sunday. And uh, this year was particularly emotional and uh, because of what happened to a lady by the name of Joyce Equishan uh, from Quebec. And most of you have probably seen on the news uh, what happened to Joyce um, in the hospital when she was trying to seek treatment um, and what she had to endure uh, from the nurses that were supposed to be taking care of her. Um, that was not an isolated in in incidence of, of racism that I can tell you from my own personal experience that that happens often. Uh, that was just um, one time that someone was able to record what happened. And um, it's been happening for a long, long time. And and I'm sure it doesn't just happen to Indigenous people. I'm sure that it, it happens to many uh, BIPOC people. And, um, and so it, it's really important that we, um, we address these issues, especially with healthcare, because we all, need, we all need healthcare and we all need to access it, especially in, in this time 
And so um, I think that it's, uh, it's really important that within here, within our territory, that we, um, we make sure that we, we address these issues and, and, and confront them head on. So that's all I wanted to say today. Thanks. Many, many thanks, uh, Sable. Um, for those of you who have been with us uh, over the last five town halls, uh, Sable always takes a moment and, and some time to share with us. And I think that um, this time in particular, the, the things that really uh, stood out for me since we last got to meet with you in this kind of setting, um, Treaty Day happened, so September 22nd happened. Um, Orange Shirt Day happened where it's a, a broad effort to wear an orange shirt and remind ourselves and uh, as a visual reminder to learn more about the history of uh, residential schools, of its impact on our young people. And then uh, again, Sable referenced the, the uh, march that happened uh, this past weekend. And the things that come to me from all of that are, um, this isn't a history lesson. This is something that is happening right now and has been happening. So as we ask people to make that land acknowledgement, as we invite um, uh, the first peoples of this land to welcome us all to this place that they have called home for time immemorial, since time immemorial, um, for us at CADA, for me, it's about a recognition that our Indigenous brothers and sisters live here right now, today, in many, many circumstances that are completely untenable. And that's a large part of why we started hosting these anti-racism town halls. There are so many of us who are on this call right now who can make it different, who can make a difference. And I'm so grateful to Sable. Every time I hear her speak, I learn something more. I discover even more what a wonderful, open, generous person she is. And I'm also very grateful to all of you who um, choose to join us for these calls and listen. And um, I hope today, um, as we do a little bit of a summary of what we heard over these last five town halls over the summer, that there are bits and pieces that you might be able to take away for you in the work you're doing and in the organizations that you may be affiliated with or um, um, work within. Um, and, uh, and I hope you learn something more about CADA and um, uh, our own journey in all of this. And, you know, trust me when I say I have certainly made my fair share of mistakes. And I am pretty sure I will continue to make those mistakes. But what I do know is um, I won't, and we as an organization will not stop trying to um, become a more equitable organization and to, um, work in a manner that is anti-racist. So thank you again, Sable, for everything you've done for us, not just today, but uh, certainly in the time that you've been a part of the Keda family. Um, so uh, uh, as I said, uh, today's uh, town hall is uh, the first little bit. I'm going to uh, share with you a bit of the history. How has Keda come through? Um, our uh, work through our work around equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the most current efforts um, that have in large part been influenced by what we've heard in these town halls. Uh, and then we're going to open it up for some Q&A I'm going to talk a little bit about next steps for us um, heading into uh, the rest of the year and next year around EDIA. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, all of that uh, we will try to sort of honor within the time, uh, the couple of hours that you've all committed to us until five o'clock. 
Um, if questions come up as we're speaking, please feel free to type them into the chat. As Greg said, we're tracking those. So I have a list of questions coming up um, so that we're sure we can capture everything. So um, I encourage you to raise any questions or ideas or thoughts that you might have. So just moving ahead, um, I want to give you uh, a, a it says here brief glimpse into our EDIA history and it, it's not brief <laughs> so so settle in folks you might want to get a drink or something but um, we just thought it was really important to share with you some of Kata's journey because for some of you in your organizations you may find yourself in a similar journey at maybe a different point and this is a long game um, you know, I'll use the example for those of you who may have received the 3550 letter and, and, and that ask being made of your organizations. It is not as simple as let me have a conversation with my board and, and then we'll, we'll go from there. It's more than that. It's a commitment to the idea of what 3550 represents. That's a long game. That's a consideration that I hope you have all been thinking about long before um, um, uh, that that correspondence was 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 shared but nevertheless the way in which you act upon it is all about where you are in your journey and so uh, we thought that by us sharing ours maybe there is some insight and some learnings that we can exchange and share so uh, in earnest we started our EDIA journey in 2016 um, and uh, although there were seeds sown long before then, uh, but we really embraced it. And I think that the thing that was most significant to us is that we tried to have humility and we tried to be transparent about recognizing the historical inequities and barriers in our granting programs and the biases that were embedded in our program criteria in our assessment processes um, and that we had a real difficulty and still have a difficulty as we try to understand, unpack and really discuss the various cultural contexts, lived experiences of marginalization or ways of knowing and sharing the impact of artistic work that isn't the same for everybody. And, and isn't something we can just apply evenly um, across a spectrum that is much broader than what our programs in the past had traditionally addressed. Um, and, 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 and traditionally addressed is 60 years of civic funding for the arts in Calgary. So we, in the last four years, have really been trying to dismantle and unpack that and try and understand that. We started to explore ways that we could increase access to funds um, without disrupting what was already a very fragile ecosystem in place, primarily with traditionally Eurocentric arts organizations that had been favored, um, but were also existing very, very close to the edge. And what could we do? How could we do that, given this, this fragility that we were seeing all organizations and artists face um, at that time? So in 2013-14, we created a program called Arts for All. And this was to um, encourage and, and, and support arts activity outside of the downtown core with a focus on East Calgary. Our first projects took place in Greater Force Lawn through a partnership with the International Avenue Business Revitalization Zone. Um, and uh, through that program and that partnership for a few years, um, we then took the time and what we learned and uh, that led to a redesigned program called ArtShare in 2016 that was guided by principles of EDIA, 
with a flexible one size fits one approach. The program was staff led and um, was always intended to be a one time project fund and not a way to support ongoing operations and programming. This was about trying to reach to communities that for for reasons of our own doing and for not really getting out and communicating that we were here um, communities didn't feel like they could have a relationship with us through our programs some of the past art share recipients have now moved into our project grant and operating grant programs uh, but certainly not the majority uh, then in 2017 uh, we began to design the original people's investment program uh, 2018 we launched it and then in 2019 we had the first distribution of grant investment funds. This program is a real benchmark and a highlight for me because the design of the program was led by a First Nations Métis and Inuit advisory committee. Um, the decision making process was FNMI led and we granted $400,000 to 41 artists in 2019 and um, in a recent share that Sable provided, um, the 2020 program doubled the number of artists who had applied to that program. So it's just been such an honor to see this program in its early stages really begin to feature um, the work of Indigenous artists um, in just a whole myriad of ways. Um, and I, I, I really want to thank that advisory and, and Sable uh, for her leadership um, in particular on this role, in, that, in her role. And also because of that work, it led us on the beginning of our own reconciliation journey in 2016 in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report and recommendations and White Goose Flying, which is a report um, uh, that the city of Calgary uh, prepared um, with their Aboriginal uh, Affairs um, uh, um, group, committee. Um, uh, coming out of that, our journey has included the Common Ground or Essena Geeks. It was gifted um, a, a Blackfoot name, it stands for those who write or draw which is a dinner and dialogue series to deepen relations and understanding between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities with artists presenting and being centered at the artistic core, um, providing artistic responses to the stories they hear from elders and the conversations that subsequently took place around the tables. Um, and then, as I said earlier, the land acknowledgements and the welcomes um, that we make uh, ahead of every gathering, um, a public gathering, are uh, uh, a way in which we uh, continue to bring meaning and understanding into our own organization, but also hopefully for the benefit of those that we are gathering with like you today. Um, with respect to uh, increasing our relations and relationships with equity seeking communities. Um, a lot of it happened through one on one meetings, thanks to the efforts of our former staff members, Jordan Balon and Amiko Meraki. Um, they really got us started on a path. Um, their participation on national and international forums and the work that took place at our Creative Calgary Congress. Uh, Tulsi Lettner um, was a, a big part of helping us deepen our learning, as was Mel VX. In this respect, um, we've dedicated research on the demographics of our sector and its underrepresentation of equity seeking communities um, through our EDIA census and the Arts Professional Survey, which, by the way, if you haven't filled out, we've extended the deadline to October 16th. Um, it's a long survey, uh, so I'll give you that. I'll just let you know right now, but please know that the information you provide to us, and maybe as I'm speaking, uh, Greg or a member of the CADA team could put the link in the chat box again. Um, the information that we garner from that survey is really critical for us. We pay a lot of attention to it. Um, it will form the basis 
of our next case to City Council when we go back for our four year budget in 2022. Um, and we really want to give as full a picture as we can. So I, I, I'm, I thank you right now ahead of time for taking the time to fill it out. It's a, it's a good 20 or 25 minutes or it took me about that long to fill it out. Um, it's for anybody who works in the arts. Um, so it's administrators, it is craftspeople, it's technicians, it's artists, anyone who works in the arts. Uh, please fill it out. And uh, there's also, uh, uh, you could win one of five $400 gift cards. There we go. Greg will be happy now. Um, and then of course, uh, in, in it, it, it took, Oh, so <laughs> Taylor, 45 minutes. Okay, maybe I'm living in my own little time bubble. Um, 2016 also marked the beginning of a residency, uh, inclusive designer in residence, JD Derbyshire. Uh, JD seriously began to help us focus our learning and our adapting through training, reflection, co design. Um, and boy when i think about that journey just for me personally uh, it has been astonishing so uh, as i said at the beginning of um, uh, my description of our journey it is a long process and for those of you who maybe feel like you're at the beginning of a process or you don't even know where to start my advice to you is start baby steps and it will seem really super, super hard, especially if you are a white led organization and you are trying to find your way to how to be more equitable. Especially if you're an organization where maybe you haven't had these conversations around EDIA with your board. And I know there are lots and I would have been one of them four years ago. And, and look at me. Um, it's not an easy conversation sometimes to bring up because we may all be at really different places on our own learning journeys. But again, I would say to you, start. You, if you need help, call us. And I can't promise that we'll give you an answer, but we probably know people who can help you find those answers. And that's what this is about. Um, this is about recognizing that we do live in a different time. We do live in a time where if you are not thinking about this as an organization who receives public dollars, you will put yourself at peril going forward. I believe more and more organizations, funders will call upon you to articulate where you are in your journey. And it's not about a right or wrong answer. It's about being on the journey. And um, so I just wanted to set that, that, that context with you and um, move on to the five um, town halls and what we heard uh, coming out of them. Some of you may recall that the very first town hall was initiated because Calgary Arts Development was being challenged for not responding sooner to the murder of George, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, uh, well, the Black Lives Matter movement period. Uh, it's, been, it's been around for years and years. And we made our first public statement um, in the spring. And to those who, who challenged us, you were right to do that. And we were late to the game. And to my colleagues in the organization, who felt so strongly, um, I want to acknowledge uh, your commitment and your desire to have CADA be a better organization than it was even four months ago. So that's how this works for us. So we held our first town hall, which was intended to be a chance for people to ask us questions about what we were doing around EDIA, anti-racism, um, working towards uh, a more equitable sector, more welcoming sector. Um, I, and, and again, I want to thank all of you who have joined us throughout uh, these last several meetings and months. Um, 
I am making a particular point of identifying individuals who spoke on behalf of, well, who spoke on their own behalf, never mind anybody else. They spoke from their heart and from their experiences. And I want you to know that as I identify each of you, I do so from a place of appreciation and, and from a place of recognizing in many instances, it was not easy for you to be able to speak up the way you did. And I really want to thank you and applaud you for that. Uh, and um, I hope that we got better at creating the conditions in this forum for you to do that. Um, it all started with Jax Gallos Aquinas reminding us that anti, an anti-racism framework is not a fixed strategy. It aligns with emergent strategies as described by Adrian Marie Brown's book. Uh, the book is called Emergent Strategy through AK Press. If any of you uh, haven't read it, it's a really good read about how we adapt and, and pivot at um, very complex and complicated times. Um, and uh, so I, I recommend it. Um, that change transforms an organization into something new and different. It's difficult to predict. There's lots of uncertainty and organizations are complex. And, and in order for the change to be deep, you will encounter these challenges. It is an ongoing and evolving process. Tyson Bankert said something that we have learned at CADA, both from working with JD and through our own experiences. And that's that you have to get comfortable with discomfort. I cannot tell you the number of times over this last several months, um, it was just too hard. This is too much. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how I'm gonna do the next thing. And I especially don't know how to work around changing a system that is so firmly embedded. Um, lots of times, and my team has heard me say it lots of times, but here we are today and we continue on. And so it's about finding a way to be in that discomfort and to know that you're not alone. And I hope that through these kinds of town halls, which I hope we will continue if you desire, um, you can build those deeper connections um, with each other uh, over time. Um, Bria Heidelberg said that failure is an important and necessary part of this process. So we can't be paralyzed by a fear of failure. It is gonna happen. You are gonna make mistakes. She also helped us understand that when you are called out, it's a gift and that the response should be to listen, acknowledge, and change your behavior. And we were reminded again by JD and Jax at our recent board retreat, there's no time for per perfection, only change. Tyson also reminded us that not everyone is at the same place. Some people have been doing this work for years and others are just starting. JD often talks about the importance of going to where people are and not assuming everyone is at the same place or assuming that everybody has to come up to where I might be. Um, it just doesn't work that way. One of the things we also heard was an appreciation for the town halls, the importance of having accountable spaces, <coughs> excuse me, where people can come together to share their thoughts, but we also heard from Wumi Adawu, and please, if I am not pronouncing your name right, correct me in the chat box, but I'm going to say your name. I'm going to try and say it and not shy away from words that may be hard to say. We learned from Wumi and others that there are a lot of conversations happening, but not enough action. Or more bluntly, by Ruby Lopez Harper, there's been enough navel gazing, enough talk. Now it's time to get shit done. <coughs> Excuse me. DJ Stages reminded us that one of the side effects of racism is that people who are directly affected sometimes hide. 
And it's important to have strategies in place to include people who are often left in the shadows. I thought that was an amazing comment and a really um, vivid reminder. Toyin Oladele describes some of the many gaps for newcomers to Calgary. Many of them don't even know where to start. And we heard from both her and Wumi that we need to find ways to make our programs more visible to those who are new to our country and to our city. We learned about the importance of not putting additional work on BIPOC um, uh, uh, individuals and uh, not compensating them for their time. Lived experience has just as much value as work experience, as volunteer experience. Why wouldn't we compensate for that? Tyson and others talked about the importance of centering voices of racialized and indigenous folks. Nothing about us without us, especially at this time that we find ourselves in. Melanie Murray Hunt reminded us that marginalized people in the throes of survival often have the most powerful things to say about our society and some of the most creative and resourceful things to contribute. Um, and that, you know, again, so much of what we heard was so resonant and over these last several months, I've seen it happen over and over. Jax talked about the importance of folks being able to show up, to be fully present and fully themselves without having to code their identities according to the spaces they attend. This is a really important learning and we are committing to continuing with our group agreements and you saw them in the chat box. Um, I'd encourage you to, to, to open them up and see if there's ways you can apply something like that in your own organizations. You all have meetings, you all have gatherings, you all connect in different ways. Having these agreements is about recognizing who's in the room um, and encouraging people to be who they are in that room. <clears throat> um, we're also uh, re guided by our principles of EDIA work, diversity, which equals a virtuous cycle, perpetuating a virtuous cycle, not a vicious one. Equity is about one size fits one. Inclusion is nothing about us without us. And accessibility equals designing for full participation. Our hope is that by sticking to those principles of EDIA, we do become a more equitable and inclusive system for Calgary's arts sector um, to work with. Because again, we're not the whole system. We don't work with everybody in the system, but we're sure going to try to live to those principles and those standards with all those that we work with and the things that we work within. <clears throat> um, we'll talk a bit later about a few more initiatives. Um, I'm mindful of time and I wanna make sure we leave a, a good chunk of time um, um, uh, to talk about some of our current events. So I'm just gonna work through uh, a few more of the things we heard. It was, there was a lot. Um, and I think we might try to find a way to, to maybe summarize this and, and put it on our site. Um, <clears throat> we heard about the water of white supremacy, or as Tyson described it, a fog, and the need for systemic change. Jax reminded us how our governments, institutions, and funding models are immersed in white supremacy, and they are, ours is. Ruby echoed this when she reminded us to stop thinking that white standards, Eurocentric white culture-based infrastructures, norms, and how to do things are, are the way to do things. It's just a way to do things. Melanie invited us to dig deeper into mental modes to the fundamental level where there is a barrier in the community in general. She encouraged us to examine the historic 
anti-black bias that is entrenched in our society that as one example doesn't recognize or acknowledge the contributions of Africans to Western culture. Pamela Zhang also suggested that these ideas of white supremacy start with youth, which caused me to reflect on the power of youth programs like Our Canada, Our Story that Melanie was involved with, or Mel VX's Black Kid Joy, or the work Benny Johnson is doing with youth who want to break into the music industry, all programs we heard about at the town halls. <clears throat> In the case for support to city council for increased funding, we talked about economic, social, and youth impacts. We know the arts play an important role in the lives of Calgarian, and we know that they promote a sense of belonging. It's back to all of those surveys and the research that um, we ask you to fill out um, uh, in many instances. Uh, we now know that we are at an important time, especially around the social impact, to accelerate our EDIA work and to ensure that the arts are for all Calgarians, not just some, and that CADA has a responsibility to um, uphold that and encourage that through the organizations that we work with, that we fund, that we connect to, that we interact with on an ongoing basis. And that includes all artists. <clears throat> Tyra Erskine shared the four parts of accountability, reflection, apology, reparation, and changed behavior. Ruby Lopez Harper and Bray Heidelberg talked about the importance of acknowledging who has been harmed by your organization and thinking about what your obligation is to heal that harm and build that bridge for, uh, let's see, we've been around since 2000, someone remind me, I think it's 2006. So, um, you know, give or take 16, 17 years. For the majority of that time, CADA has harmed individual artists because we basically didn't feel like you existed and warranted your own funding. You had to be part of an organization. And it wasn't until um, um, 2013, 14, so eight years after we were recreated, recrafted, that we actually had an individual artist program. So that's an example of harm in a community. Um, and, you know, and, and many other communities in a similar way. Uh, so it is important to reflect on that and to think about that and how your actions may have caused harm, regardless of your intention. Because no one ever assumes that about anybody that you intend that harm. That doesn't mean it's not harm or that it's not harmful. That's what we were reminded by. Tyson echoed this when he said that white folks must take responsibility for how they have been complicit in or interacted with forces even that have harmed people. Um, first meeting we did about the work that's been done um, will give you uh, um, and to where we are now gives you a bit of that reflection that we have done in our role um, we still have work to do but as i say often we are public stewards of public dollars in the interests of the public good which includes artists and because of that i feel a deep responsibility and an accountability to ask all of those questions that I just reflected on and I, um, that we were reminded on. And that's what our team has been doing in a very um, thoughtful and I think deep way. We also acknowledge that our granting programs have been barriers, have had barriers, well, and been barriers, um, and biases since the beginning, and that they have favored white Eurocentric art forms and arts organizations. The size of grant has often been correlated to the length of time an organization has been in a program. For years, we didn't have enough money to go around, and we still don't, by the way. Um, so, but prior to 2019, it was a real challenge to invite new artists and new organizations into the fold because we knew that it would either be about spreading the peanut butter thinner or displacing others who had been in the system 
And um, in those moments at that time, we did not feel like we could do that. And that speaks back to the fragility of the system overall um, that I spoke to earlier. <clears throat> now, however, we do have more money and we have a greater understanding of the needs of the arts communities in our city and the disparities and the gaps that exist within them. Part of the reparation that we are undertaking is the ongoing development um, and redevelopment of our grant investment programs, uh, all of them. But in particular, we are um, learning a lot from our art share and OPIT programs that specifically target funds for equity seeking communities. We heard from Jessica McCann and Toya Noladele that the art share programs flexible application and reporting processes worked well for them and they appreciated having the opportunity to build a stronger relationship with a program officer. Grant writing can be a barrier and we heard from Mpoe Mugale that grant writing skills shouldn't be the thing we're assessing. Let's ensure we are really assessing the idea and not the grant writing skill. Pam Zhang suggested a mentorship program to help folks navigate their careers and the granting bodies we've been, and, and the granting bodies. Uh, we've been looking into how we might be able to provide services to help people navigate their careers much in the way Pam suggested or to address the gaps Toyin talked about. We don't know exactly the form it's going to take yet, but it's high on our list. <clears throat> We're also working hard to change our behavior and our culture. Using the AROC, anti-racist organizational change, organize, uh, onion model, for organizations. We're looking at every aspect of our organization and here are some of the questions that we're holding. We heard about a lack of representation of BIPOC on boards, staff, stages, offices, and particularly in decision making and leadership positions. How can we incorporate more specific anti-racist HR policies, particularly in areas like equitable hiring processes and recruitment for board and staff, which also support the 3550 initiative? How can we learn through our EDIA census um, uh, how to affect change in the sector as a whole? How can we help work with the sector, especially larger, more traditional organizations for the time in the future when questions about their commitment to EDIA and anti-racism will directly affect their grant success? How do we incorporate EDIA into everyone's work plans at CADA and create EDIA indicators to measure the impact of our work? How can we remove more barriers by having clearer and more extensive accommodation and accessibility options for applicants? How do we improve the representation, EDI training, cultural understanding, and processes for our grant assessments? How do we decolonize our programs? We heard from Brea, Ruby, Tyra, Tyson, Jax and many others about the importance of language and having a shared understanding of language. How do we ensure the use of plain language in our communications, including clarity about what we mean when we use words like equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, and the many, many other words and terms we hear, we hear and heard about at the town halls? Would a micro grants program better serve the needs of specific communities or types of funding? Um, examples are newcomer communities, disability arts, et cetera. How do we move from being, how do we move beyond being an ally to becoming an accomplice in our anti-racism work? Knowing that there are things that CADA can and can't do? How do we commit to deep listening and trying to influence our support when we can 
For example, we heard from Benny Johnson that there are not enough spaces for black artists to do their work. And this was echoed by a number of other people. I don't know what we can do specifically to address that concern, but knowing it and confronting it and acknowledging it um, opens up the possibilities um, for us to make introductions, for us to raise it with landlords and with other people who might hold space that could be available. Benny also told us about the stereotypes that he and black men face constantly. We've seen that in the news right here in Calgary very recently. He reminded us that black is not a monolith, neither is indigenous, and how it's worth understanding individual cultures and not lumping all black people together. This brings us to a phrase that Jax shared and one that we had recently learned from JD uh, that we have really come to love. And it's the concept of cultural humility. We will hold the principles of cultural humility closely as we do our work going forward. And Jax credited Melanie Turvalon and uh, Jan Murray Garcia. It's a lifelong commitment to learning and critical self-reflection, a desire to fix power imbalances, institutional accountability and mutual respect, and partnership based on trust. And I'm just gonna say that last sentence again, because, and think about this in your role as an artist. Don't you already do this through your practice? A lifelong commitment to learning and critical self-reflection, a desire to fix power imbalances, institutional accountability and mutual respect, and partnership based on trust. Every great artist that I can think of, many of whom live in Calgary, by the way, I would associate those principles with them. So how do we make sure that is embedded in our art sector? Because think about what the sector could be if they were. The principles that guide the Art Share program are generosity, trust, learning, and reciprocity. We are examining how we can bring these principles into all of our programs as they are closely tied to this concept of cultural humility. I got two more points, kids. Hang in with me. We heard that there is a lot of trauma in BIPOC communities. Tyson talked specifically about the need to create a community of care and shared many ideas on what that means. How can we contribute to creating conditions for a community of care in the art sector? And Cesar Calla, our other inclusive designer in residence, reminded us that anti-racism work is both an effort to dismantle, but it's also there to reclaim and reconstruct, evolve and create. And he asked, as we look at dismantling some of the inequities that we see, how do we start reclaiming and constructing as well? He also suggests that the work done internally in organizations needs to happen simultaneously with our outside organizations, working on the kind of social change that we need across the community and throughout the city. And it's why, again, I believe so strongly in arts-led city building. Artists should be at the tables when we talk about the city's mental well-being, about our economic well-being, about how we can affect our youth. You should all be there in those discussions. That's how we'll get to being a better place for all of us and not some of us. So that's my brief glimpse. 57 minutes later. Thank you all for your patience and listening. Um, we now are going to move into just talking about three particular initiatives that um, uh, Kate is working on right now. And I'm just going to cue Cesar to get ready because I'm going to hand off to you. Um, 
and uh, uh, three things in particular. Um, uh, the cultural instigators, citizen artists YYC, and the community working group on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. And because I've been talking too much, I think I'm just going to be quiet now and hand off to Cesar to talk about the first two, cultural instigators, citizen artist YYC, and then I'll come back to talk about the community working group and um, open it up for Q&A. So uh, uh, Cesar, my friend, over to you. Hey, thank you, Patty, for uh, that uh, comprehensive summary um, of KDA's work, but as well uh, over the years and also um, the most recent conversations uh, from the town hall. So I, I was just listening to the content that uh, you talked about that we focused on from the town halls and there we, we covered a lot of ground. So. Um, and I think there's so many things that we can pick up from, uh, from the conversations, both in terms of our own individual work, but also organizationally, sector-wide, and also that we need to bring out into Calgary. So I will um, talk about two things. Um, the Citizen Artists YYC initiative, as well as the cultural instigators. So I do have a uh, a slide deck that I want to share, and I think I can do that. Can I? Okay. Uh, is that on? Okay. Good. So, um, but before anything else, um, I also want to introduce two of the community instigate, cultural instigators who are with us today uh, in this town hall meetings. And uh, Patty have, have also cited some of their contribution to the discussions uh, in the previous town hall. So, um, with us today are Jax Aquinas and Pam Zen. So they will be part of this conversation as well. Um, but I want to start with this um, and a quote from Adrian Marie Brown that art is not neutral. It either upholds or disrupts the status quo and advancing or regressing justice. Because it's important to really ground uh, the, the actions that we're trying to build uh, around the nature of our practice as well as artists and arts workers and also as citizens. The uh, other thing that I want to say is that as Patty mentioned, I think um, in one of the town, so, town halls, I mentioned that our work is both internal in, within our own organizations or within our own uh, smaller communities and affinity groups, but it's also social. Um, that our effort is not to build, not just, or not to build the best organization that we can have anchored on, on equity and on social justice, but we are at the end of the day really trying to build social change. Right? And those two things come hand in hand, that as we build our um, really good and responsive um, the organizations, um, that goes hand in hand with the social change work that needs to happen out there in the community around organizing more broadly, around building movements, around building coalitions of actions and, and so on. So those are really important. That's why uh, those are the premises of these two uh, initiatives that I want to talk about. Um, so um, two initiatives that are both emergent and are both community facing, uh, because again, uh, 
understanding that in social change, it's important that there's really long-term uh, collective capacity in communities um, to sustain uh, the work of uh, social change and creating an anti-racist society, as well as having really responsive institutions uh, that uh, are trying to um, live the uh, live the claims of equity work, right? So we, you need both. And um, from my experience in in this work, uh, oftentimes when you have public institutions that are leading social change issues and so on, that's great. But oftentimes they are not sustainable uh, and um, are not deepened if the capacity of the communities themselves um, don't have that strength to um, sustain the work, but also to make uh, public institutions accountable and to advocate for policy and systems change. So, so these two initiatives are premised on that. They're both emergent uh, uh, and they're as we, as we speak, we're, learning, we're starting to get some early learnings from both of them. So um, I'll start with, so they're supported by, but not led by CADA, which is, I think, a really good setup for, for, this, for both of these. So Citizens of Artists YYC, um, what is this moment asking of us? JD uh, and I started working more closely at the beginning of the year. And one of the things that we heard from conversations with people in the sector and uh, people who kind of hover around the sector is the notion of safe spaces and brave spaces for conversation, but also for um, incubating ideas and possibly even actions. So when the pandemic hit, then suddenly um, space, became, space became quite different in, in terms of what we mean by that. And many uh, artists find themselves in uh, constricted spaces. And so this idea of bringing together folks took on more of a virtual reality. And so we, we uh, started this, uh, or started to convene this space, uh, which we call Citizen Artists YYC, in early June of 2020. And the question that we posed is, what is this moment asking of us? Then after that, of course, uh, as everybody knows, um, the murder of George Floyd happened in the US, and then the acceleration of protest and um, the strengthening of Black Lives Matter movements in Calgary and elsewhere. So that those two things kind of shaped the citizen artists YYC conversations. So it, has, it is virtual for now. And so we hold space and it has become a space for collective learning, sharing and the creative imagination of an artist led movement for an anti-racist Calvary. So, so far, uh, we have probably more than 40 artists and many of you in this town hall have attended one or two or, or all of the chat and choose. That's what we call our weekly uh, gatherings. Um, have participated in the citizen artists weekly chat and choose. So like the town halls, we are, uh, we are in a little bit of a break to find out what, uh, the sentiments are, the thoughts are, or the interests are of where we will go with the chat and choose. There have been a number of interesting ideas on how to move forward with that. But in, um, an important thing is that it has really incubated a lot of ideas that we can start working on. And so, um, Thanks, Jax, for putting this together. Um, how do I turn? Don't call me. 
<laughs> my cell phone is ringing. Anyway, so uh, this just kind of uh, summarizes some of the things that have transpired in the citizen artist YYC timeline. Um, we talked about brave spaces, uh, and our discussions have really ranged from uh, issues related to the issues that have been surfaced by Black Lives Matter, coping with COVID-19, anti-racism, how do we hold brave spaces, learning how to uh, hold accountable spaces, right? Uh, and then we, um, and then something happened. But before I want, uh, oops, how do I go back to this? Okay. Um, and so we started uh, going into um, designing around that key question that one, uh, several of the participants in the chat and two raised. How do you build an anti-racist Calgary? And what is the role of an artist-led movement in all of that? So that set us off in, in many discussions and in um, spurring uh, and spawning many possible actions and initiatives that we can start um, exploring. Um, so Jax and Pam, if you want to uh, add on your own thoughts, please do so as well. So, but I can't see you. <laughs> so maybe if you could unmute your mics and just come in as well, that's fine. So, um, so the cultural instigators are, are kind of linked to the Citizen Artist YYC initiative. Um, and so I like the idea of the word instigators. I come from, my background is uh, community organizing and a lot of um, kind of community advocacy and activist work. So we often use the word co uh, community organizing um, and issue-based organizing. Uh, but JD and I, when we started talking, we, came, we kind of landed on a term, the uh, instigators. And it, when I started kind of um, researching what it means, so it means a lot around inciting, provoking, bringing together, creating. So it's, it's, it's dynamic. It's a dynamic kind of role, which really embodies uh, the, the myriad roles that artists play in the community because their own work, of, the work of artists instigates it, the work incites and provokes and brings people together and creates. So how do we use this kind of natural role of, or not use, but use it as a starting point of instigating social change? Hi, Hi Pam. <laughs> um, so, just in terms of a brief description, um, artist organizers or artist citizens, cultural instigators or artist citizens and organizers, learning and helping to build more collective capacity in the arts communities for equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, working on community projects for change. Um, I think many of you are naturally cultural instigators and so, uh, so the two uh, initiatives came hand in hand. As we move forward with a conversation in Citizen Artists YYC, a few of uh, a number of artists participants have offered to um, take on more role 
as instigators. So that's how we started and we've started to build that together with help from CADA uh, as well uh, in terms of resourcing the work. So basically we came out with three purposes kind of to, to frame the work of cultural instigators. One is uh, reimagining what equity seeking artwork could look like, right? How do we reimagine and even instigate the, um, the emergence of, and I've, I'm sure there are already many of this, but how do you instigate more of um, artwork that are equity seeking uh, and uh, deliberate in terms of bringing people together and communities together um, to confront, but also to create. And then building capacity for change uh, in the various communities uh, where artists are, including exploring what safe spaces are for building knowledge and building uh, the sharing among artists in the community. Uh, and so, for instance, with citizen artists YYC chat and choose, how will that evolve? Will it evolve into actual many different chat, chat and choose uh, located in many different communities, um, facilitated by, led by uh, artists, artists, citizens themselves? And the third one is around developing willingness and capacity to share and expand knowledge from different communities. We're, really, we're learning a lot around what some of the things that, been sh that have been shared in the, in the um, town halls around building trust and solidarity across different communities, including especially uh, equity seeking communities. How, will, how can that look like? Right. So this work has just started in the last two or three months, and we're currently building up the team of cultural instigators to um, to start instigating. Pam and Jax, you want to add anything? Uh, Pam and Jax have been uh, uh, part of the cultural instigators work for the last few months. Um, I think I could add some things in the next few slides um, okay. yeah. you're sharing. Um, sure, sure. And then this happened at a chat and chew. <laughs> I, I'm sure we remember this moment, right? And I think it was Alan Rosales who posed this question, right? At, that, at the end of the day, what is an anti-racist Calgary? And how can artists help build a movement or an anti-racist Calgary, right? What is that all about? And many ideas were starting to be shared among them, and I think Sable le uh, kind of led these ideas around. Uh, and she said that actually, we, we really need to start thinking about the roots of EDIA in the indigenous history of Mohensis. Because there's much, there's a lot to that. That she talked about, you know, there, there were annual uh, gatherings of people before settlers came in, where they would renew relationships to the land, relationships with each other, right? And, and renew their commitment to the language. So that's, that's, and, and that's not part of, of, of Calgary or Mackenzie's history. So we have a lot of monuments around settlement, but we have very few monuments to the roots of EDIA, especially anchored on indigenous history and language. So that came about, that's one idea. And then uh, Wunmi and Melanie and many others talked about the empowerment of black artists. I think in the town halls, um, uh, summaries, uh, this has been shared as well around uh, the exclusion of many black artists in the landscape of the arts in the actual, uh, actual opportunities to practice their art as well. 
And then ideas of our, about a gathering, a conference on anti-racism arts. Building art as movements, actual physical movements within communities, among ourselves. And then researching to show a more equitable representation of art and artists in Calgary. Because there's, there are many, even in the way we talked about the sector, many are excluded. So those are ideas that have started to emerge from the uh, conversations uh, when that question was posed. So we actually spent a, a number of chat and choose diving into this. And then something I, uh, I what's happening here? Oops. Uh, Sorry, you just gotta press it like 22 times. <laughs> to get the whole slide sorry thank you Jax, for i didn't know it would copy and over the animation <laughs> this reminded Great. us about uh <laughs> this reminded us uh about what adrian marie brown was talking about around um emergent strategies right uh about how do you actually look at what's and I talk about the, the purple arrows, what's emerging from, from the landscape, from, from the actual living history that we're looking at, from the things that are, that are emerging from the, from, from, from the ground up, from, from the realities of the day, right? And how that, that we need to be responsive, but also be, be humble to learn what those are telling us so that this can then really shape our actions uh, and, and, and have the capacity to, to change course, to be fluid, to be, to be responsive to emergent realities. And so that our strategies are based on the realities of the times rather than on strategies that are based on notions that have become uh, false probably or that have become uh, disconnected to the emergent realities and I think some of these ideas have emerged from that thinking and so and then we met penguins <laughs> I think it was Pam who started talking to us about this you want to talk about this Pam maybe this is the one you, I can bring you in <laughs> Sure. Um, so I think I've mentioned this and Jax has mentioned this in, in the town halls and also other um, virtual encounters with many folks in community, um, which is uh, the work, um, the words of Jenea Future Khan, who is an international ambassador for the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. And um, um, they talked about um, the power of penguins <laughs> and uh, the way penguins organize themselves to take care of those who are most vulnerable. So in the Antarctic, um, to like survive the Antarctic freeze, um, those, they huddle together and spiral and move to keep their heat. And those who are um, the hottest on the inside will move towards the outside and those who are most cold are spiral inward to the center and that's how they take care of those who are most vulnerable and this um Jenea described this as the way in which um we in this moment need to organize is to consider that um at the center that we need to care for the indigenous people and then those who, the black and then people of color. And then that those who have had more uh, privilege to be on the outside attending to and supporting in solidarity those at the center. Does this become kind of the framework in which we developed um, how we would move forward with the cultural instigators foundationally and as well through, um, which in the next slide, <laughs> so sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, this is the slide, right? Yeah. 
there's that slide. Um, so the way we would organize for um, imagining a really larger scale project um, that visions an anti-racist Calgary. Um, so this actual graphic is designed by Jax. <laughs> um, and it shows the penguin spiral formation um, as a way of community organizing. And it's a visualization of a grant that was prepared for the City of Calgary Anti-Racism Capacity Building Fund, which was kind of spearheaded and like visioned by citizen artist YYC and then members of the cultural instigators who helped just get that grant in. <laughs> um, so you can see um, at the center of the spiral, um, you have the, uh, an Indigenous-led project and framework that is speaking about colonial narratives related to monuments and land and um, land use policy in Calgary. Um, and then we have a Black-led empowerment project. Um, and, then, um, and then we have racialized um, non-Black and non-Indigenous um, project, and then um, a grappling, which is this fourth one, which would be accessible to all to participate in. And then we have a coalition of partners on the outside. Um, Jax, do you have anything to contribute to this? I kind of wanted to add uh, to how consistently, even though I was part of uh, the anti-racist organizational change project for four years, I never was fully aware that anti-racism is an emergent process until I joined the CI, really, because um, it's a, it, it, the anti-racism framework itself is consistently undoing and unlearning white supremacy, unlearning how um, urgency or how uh, the way or a way has become the, you know, a consistent um, expectation of how we do things. And um, this project and working with the other instigators has made it very clear that saying, okay, uh, let's just slow down here. Uh, why is this urgent? And does it need to be urgent? And uh, then reassessing how the process unfolds and who's at the table and what voices are being heard and who's contributing to each layer um, really made it clear that every, every little arrow in that emergent strategy um, diagram was, is, is every decision that, that's just been, I guess, collaborated on with, every, with each project that we work on. So um, to, to add to this diagram, uh, I think, it's a great way of, of understanding how consistently centering Black and Indigenous voices guides and reminds us that, uh, that we are here because of colonialism. We are here and uh, working against a system that has been created to serve, um, serve a certain narrative, but now shifting that is, has, we have to be intentional and move with um, like recorrecting course every time uh, because like there are tendencies like all of us have tendencies on on how we want to like operate so um, it is being consistently grounded and mindful because that's how um, our relationships can be maintained with each other as well uh, which is essential to the community organizing the community of care that uh, Patty also mentioned that Tyson mentioned uh, yeah, we're only going to be able to create these changes, this anti-racist future of Calgary, through our relationships with each other, through community, and and that starts with how we how we um, meet each other and each other's humanity. That's my final thought for now. So we have adopted this as both a an organizing framework uh, in. Uh, recruiting cultural instigators, for instance, and also uh, supporting initiatives in the communities and so on, as Jackson Pam mentioned, is around centering um, 
uh, Black and Indigenous voices and and capacities and yearnings and uh, but as well uh, looking at this as you know the the uh, the importance of self organizing within these different um, spiral elements and supporting self organizing because what we're really finding out is that uh, this notion of solidarity also hinges on uh, strength from each of the communities, right? That solidarity really is strengthened by stronger uh, capacities within each of these um, uh, spirals as well. So that uh, the issues that are important to them uh, are surfaced. And we are also linking this to policy asks, like for instance, in terms of monuments and language. Uh, land use in Calgary, in Mukensis, is a, an important piece of policy that keeps on marginalizing the history of, um, of First Nations, of indigenous uh, uh, communities in Calgary as well. Oops. Okay, but we are also we have also used this as a project planning tool. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, once we have really um, uh, said thank you to the penguins and giving us this insight, we decided to respond to the city of Calgary's anti-racism capacity building proposal, and using that framework to bring together a project. Uh, uh, a comprehensive project that uses this framework to uh, to claim public resources for this important work of artist-led uh, social change and artist-led movement for anti-racism. And so, um, that's, so that's where we are at the moment. Uh, we actually landed with the name of the proposal um, that we brought together to for the city and so it in, uh, we call it bringing power to truth this was first used by action dignity in uh, our canada our story uh, and so it's important because oftentimes artists are artists are said to play the role of speaking truth to power and oftentimes that gets tokenized or, or um, what do you call it, or tolerated, that artists through their art can confront and can speak truth to power. But I think the next part is often not talked about. How do you actually bring power to truth so that change can happen? How do you bring power to truth seekers around organizing and their capacity to impact systems and policies. So that's what we've called the project. Uh, hopefully we get resources or we could cobble together a spiral of resources to support this project. Okay, I, um, we did a lot of talking, um, but any uh, last thoughts, Jax and Pam, before we hand it over to Patty again? We're good? Okay, thanks. We, I did come, come up with this set of questions that maybe Patty can use anyway. Around, uh, but I think she will also talk about the uh, community working group, right? Yeah, I will. Thank you, Cesar. If you can leave that slide up, though, I think that might be a good, um, people can have a look at those questions and, and maybe add any thoughts. Um, I also know that uh, another question came up. I talked about 3550 earlier on, and um, uh, some people aren't sure what that is or don't know what that is, so I'll talk a bit about that. Um, the third component, component that Cesar uh, referenced is the community working group uh, on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. And earlier on, I spoke to um, uh, Bria talking about the, how imperative it is to have an equity statement for an organization. And again, so uh, for those of you who are with organizations, um, 
you know, maybe that's a future town hall uh, to talk about, you know, what it takes to craft one for your organization. Um, we certainly uh, have uh, been working on one for quite some time. Um, the learnings from the town hall are something that uh, we want to use to influence and impact us in this respect. And the community working group is going to be a group of individuals from the community who will help us and be another set of voices um, that can advise us as we um, undertake uh, the crafting of that statement which is a uh, um, uh, the next priority that we are uh, working on um, they'll be working in concert with an internal staff working group that has already formed and, and met uh, a number of times, uh, particularly around the organization of these town halls. And I do want to thank uh, each of you uh, who were a part of that for helping us. This was um, yet another new thing on top of many new things that happened this year. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. Um, in particular today, I just wanted to thank Helen uh, she has helped me immensely in helping create what we call show flows, which is just laying out the order and the kinds of topics we'll discuss. And, and today in particular, what you heard me read from um, uh, on our EDIA journey was Helen crafting all of that from the over, uh, let's see, 10 hours of town hall transcripts and meetings all of which are uh, the recordings still exist on our website. So you can watch previous town halls if you like. Um, particular, well, they were all great, but Brea and Ruby's was really great. Um, uh, so thank you all very much uh, from on the internal uh, staff team. Um, so the working group, uh, it will help accelerate our EDI work in addressing a lot of concerns that we heard about in the summer. As I said, Ruby talked about the need for a formal, explicit EDI statement. Uh, that is the hallmark of our intentionality around our EDIA work. I would say that even though we've been working quite um, intently, uh, intentionally uh, since 2016, it's, it's kind of been under the radar. We haven't been super transparent and vocal about it until now. And we need to be, and an equity statement will help us continue to do that and, and hold ourselves to that kind of hallmark. Um, uh, creating the EDA statement is at the top of our list. It's one of our priorities. And this working group will be that sounding board for us in these first steps. Um, uh, uh, some of you may have seen the call for members to join that committee. It was an application process. Um, I have to say we were just tremendously humbled by the caliber and the thoughtfulness of the applications that we received. Um, we received many, many more than I thought we would. Um, and so as a result, it's taken us quite a bit of time and some of you may very well be individuals who applied. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, a, a small internal group has met and we have identified uh, the initial membership of that group and we're currently in process of reaching out to everybody who applied. So you will hear from us one way or the other um, and uh, at very soon. Um, so uh, again, I thank you for applying and um, we will share the work of that community working group in the days to come. Um, I also just wanted to thank Cesar and Jax and Pam for uh, taking the time to talk about uh, the cultural instigators and um, the uh, uh, citizen artist YYC projects. Um, that penguin metaphor is amazing. I love that this group got together and wrote this grant. Um, and I'm very eager and keen to see what's happening there. Um, thank you, Pam, for articulating what the 3550 initiative is. Um, there's a, and Jax for putting the website in. So if you go to the chat box, um, for those who asked about what 3550 is, 
the information is there in the chat box, so I won't uh, repeat it. Um, we're at 447, so we do have some time for uh, some open conversation or discussion. Um, so I'm just going to move my chat box over here. Um, so for those of you who have participated in previous town halls, uh, maybe what you heard today, um, we would welcome uh, your insight and your thoughts um, on, on what you heard or if there are other questions you have. Um, I, I'd welcome those at this time. Um, I see in my show flow, Wumi and Tyson were trying to get in and they got stuck in the waiting room. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't see them in the participants list. So uh, hopefully we will find a way or they will get to see the recordings. But I, I'm sorry, I just saw that statement now and it's probably been here for a while. Um, uh, does anybody have any thoughts or any questions that they'd like to share? I kind of feel like this is a, a, a bit of a closing of the, the loop with respect to this summer's town halls. Um, and we started our very first town hall with opening it up to questions from the community. And, and so I would welcome any thoughts or insights um, uh, uh, or anxieties, maybe, uh, that, that you feel like you, you might be okay to share. Um, uh, and, and that includes members of my team, by the way. If there was anything you wanted to add to what I articulated in our journey, I would welcome that from any of you. Um, I'm doing a scan. It's a little bit harder to do when we have the... piece up. Anyone? Anything? Anybody from the team who wants to make a comment or say anything? I'm just scanning, scanning. Cesar, Jax, or Pam, anything more you wanted to add to uh, what you've already discussed with respect to your experiences or the work that's, or the conversations that have happened so far? Hi, Pam. Um, I can. Hi. Um, I can add just a little bit um, um, a note about 3550 briefly, which is just um, this initiative um, um, is, is kind of grounded at first by a coalition of artists in the uh, dance and theater communities. And, but it's meant to be kind of open source and adaptable across disciplines. And so though um, the actions um, that 3550 is pretty like specific towards performing arts companies, just understanding and, and taking ownership and accountability to the, the framework that we're working with in terms of what is provided in the letter. Um, this letter, this action is meant to be adaptable and use across the sector. So it's highly encouraged that if you're in from the visual arts um, or music that um, working towards 35% uh, BIPOC representation in your organizations um, and 50% women and non-binary um, is viable. Um, and it's a diff it's really challenging work, and we understand that there's a lot of barriers to it. Um, but um, if we all take this as a prompt to kind of look internally, and if you really look at the stats of um, and track records of um, uh, a nonprofit organization's um, trajectory, um, the story is very clear. Um, I highly recommend checking out um, Theatre Alberta made a publication um, of um, the Citadel's commitment to the 3550 and um, the response is really um, encouraging and um, if you're looking for inspiration um, that is somewhere something to read.
this is one more thing that I wanted to add. Thanks for that, Pam. And uh, this is uh, just a word that I learned from Jarrett, two young men, when we were writing this. Uh, that grant uh, proposal was oh, wait, is it Ogananen? Ogananen? I'm saying it wrong. It's in Dakota. Uh, I will get it right, but I would love to learn this word in Blackfoot, Dene, and Sudina. But um, it, it refers to the displacement of people, uh, how we're all scattered, how we're really referring to um, the Yarhe Nakoda being scattered. And this probably leads some insight to how the 3550 could be a successful initiative by 2024, is if uh, we do rebuild and work on our relationships and renew relationships with each other, because that's the best way that we can build out um, that those numbers in our organizations and our communities, uh, because it we it's one thing to engage from a top down level, but if you actually know people and people trust you and know that your organization and your intentions are coming from a place of of deep commitment to changing how things are, I think that's a great way to understand how we're going to work together. Um, thanks, Patty. Thanks, Kata team and uh, Cesar and Pam for putting it all together. And uh, I hope we continue these. Uh, thanks so much, Jax and Pam, uh, for, for that added piece. Um, uh, Pam's put another link in um, uh, uh, under the chat box. Um, we have another question about where can folks send suggestions for future town hall topics? what's the best email address or um, if you want to provide feedback. Uh, we have an email address and uh, maybe someone from the team can put it in edia at calgaryartsdevelopment.com. Um, if you send it to that email address, it comes to me and, uh, uh, and, and Sarah and Helen, the other members of our leadership team. So EDIA is a commitment that we are making right at uh, throughout our organization. Um, as I said earlier, JD and Jax were at our board retreat recently on September 22nd, Treaty Day, uh, for making, uh, for Treaty 7. Um, and we spent the whole morning talking about our work in EDIA. Uh, and that was really the first time. Uh, it, and it's 2020, and we started this work in 2016. Um, so, there is a commitment at the leadership level in our organization to continue this work. So that email address, that email comes to, to us. Um, and we would welcome any suggestions that you have. Um, um, just in the conversations among ourselves, it feels like when we have guest panels or topics, there appears to be more of a membership. So that's a learning. Um, and, and I would take that to the community working group, um, uh, which will be a group that meets with me, by the way. Um, as the, the CEO of this organization, because we really wanted to ensure that the voices um, um, uh, around that table were directly connected to uh, the leadership in the organization at the topmost level. Um, so again, for those of you who are thinking about, well, how do I even introduce this conversation? How do I connect it to our team? All those things. Um, the first conversation, if you aren't already the artistic director or the executive director or the CEO, is to have a conversation with your artistic director, your executive director, or your CEO, or your board chair. Um, get that commitment to make the change. Um, and if you need to haul me in to have that conversation, or a member of our team, as she once again volun tells them, um, will be a part of that. Uh, that conversation, so the, the ability to be able to speak about our journey and our experiences from whatever perspective we bring, I hope might be a helpful one for our community. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Asia, for the heart sign. I, I take it that means you might be taking us up on that offer, which is awesome. Um, uh, uh, unless there's any other comments, I'm looking at the shared doc. I don't see any having come to any of our teammates. Um, Helen, I'm saying this out loud. Am I missing anything? Is there, I don't think I've forgotten anything. 
Nope. Um, there was a lot there. Um, so uh, maybe on that note, um, again, thank you all very much for being a part of the journey today. For those of you who have joined us on previous town halls, uh, again, thank you for, for being with us. Um, uh, and well, and just being a part of this experience. Uh, there's more work to be done for sure. Um, remember about what it is to live in that discomfort um that is a reality and i think all of us have discovered what it is to live in discomfort thank you very much COVID 19. um so you're all here so i know you can do it i know you have that resiliency um and i also know that we're all here together in this space so uh, a, a thank you for being with us today um many thanks to uh, everybody that it takes to put this town hall on you know who you are um i'm really grateful and uh, until next time, and there will be a next time, um, I hope you all have a, an amazing rest of the day and rest of the week and an awesome, happy turkey day. Uh, we'll see you all later. Bye. <laughs>